The larynx controls the passage of air into and out of the trachea. The muscles of the larynx can both open and close the airway. In addition, the muscles of the larynx adjust the length and tension of the vocal folds, leading to the production of voice sounds. We'll start by seeing where the larynx is and what it looks like from behind and from above. Next, we'll look at the cartilages of the larynx and the vocal ligaments. Then we'll look at the muscles and the movements they produce. At the end of this section, we'll also see the infrahyoid muscles that are in front of the larynx and the thyroid gland that's just below it. We'll start by looking at the front of the neck, with just the skin and subcutaneous tissue removed. We'll remove the sternocleidomastoid muscles and the clavicles. And we'll also remove these slender muscles, the infrahyoid muscles. We'll see them later. This is the thyroid gland. We'll see it later too. For now, we'll remove it. Here's the thyroid cartilage. Here below it is the cricoid cartilage, hidden by the cricothyroid muscle. These two cartilages form the framework of the larynx. The thyroid cartilage is suspended from the hyoid bone, which is here, by the thyrohyoid membrane. Below, the cricoid cartilage is continuous with the upper end of the trachea. Here on each side, this sleeve of connective tissue, the carotid sheath, contains the major blood vessels of the head and neck. We'll remove the carotid sheaths. We'll also remove the musculoskeletal structures behind and below the larynx. Here's the trachea. Here's the esophagus. Here's the lower part of the pharynx. To see the larynx from behind, we'll remove the posterior wall of the pharynx. Here's the opening of the larynx, the superior laryngeal aperture. It faces almost directly backwards. The opening is formed in front by the epiglottic cartilage, on each side by this fold of soft tissue, the aryepiglottic fold, and behind by two important structures that we'll meet in a minute, the arytenoid cartilages. The space that's lateral to the aryepiglottic fold is the piriform recess. Here in front of the epiglottis is the back of the tongue. The space between the tongue and the epiglottis is the vellicula. To see the larynx from inside, we'll look at a specimen that's been divided in the midline. Here's the epiglottis. Here's the aryepiglottic fold. Here's the divided thyroid cartilage and the divided arch and lamina of the cricoid cartilage. The important features of the wall of the larynx are this small side cavity, the vestibule, and these two folds in the mucous membrane, the vestibular fold above and the vocal fold below. Just beneath the mucosa of the vocal fold is an important structure, the vocal ligament, which we'll see shortly. Here's the larynx in the living body, seen from above with an endoscopic camera. Here's the epiglottis. Here's the left aryepiglottic fold. Here are the vestibular folds. Here are the vocal folds. Here between them, we're looking down through the vocal opening into the trachea. To get a preview of the muscles of the larynx, we'll remove the mucous membrane from here down to here. Some of the muscles of the larynx are visible here. Others are hidden by the thyroid cartilage. We'll see these muscles later in this section. Before we look at the muscles, we need to take a further look at the cartilages of the larynx. Then we need to understand the vocal ligaments and the vocal opening. In looking at the cartilages, we'll first revisit the thyroid and cricoid cartilages, which we saw in the last section. Then we'll add to our picture the epiglottic cartilage and the small but important arytenoid cartilages. We took a good look at the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage in the last section. As we saw, the two cartilages articulate here. When the arch of the cricoid moves up and down, the top of the lamina moves backward 
and forward. The two cartilages are held together at the front by the strong cricothyroid membrane, which is part of a larger structure, as we'll see later. Now we'll add the epiglottic cartilage to the picture. The epiglottic cartilage is shaped like a leaf with a slender stem that's attached here to the thyroid cartilage. The epiglottic cartilage is also attached to the body of the hyoid bone by fibrous tissue that runs through this pad of fat. The epiglottic cartilage is covered by mucous membrane here on the back and on the front down to here. The epiglottic cartilage is highly flexible. Next we'll add the arytenoid cartilages to the picture. Here they are. The arytenoid cartilages, which are highly mobile, sit on top of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage, just to each side of the midline. They articulate with the cricoid cartilage at these two surfaces. Here's the right arytenoid cartilage, seen from behind. This tall upward projection is the colliculus. This pointed forward projection is the vocal process. The vocal ligament is attached here. On the underside, this inward-facing articular surface articulates with the cricoid cartilage. Next to the articular surface, this projection on the lateral aspect is the muscular process. Muscles are attached to the muscular process and also to the lateral border and to this broad convex surface which faces forwards. The top of the colliculus is prolonged by this tiny corniculate cartilage which faces backwards. In the intact larynx, the arytenoid cartilages are here. When seen from the side, the arytenoid cartilage is here with the vocal process just in line with the vocal fold. The arytenoid cartilages can move laterally and medially, and they can rotate about a vertical axis. When the muscular process moves backward and forward, the vocal process is abducted and adducted. Now that we've looked at the skeleton of the larynx, it's time to get acquainted with the vocal ligament and the vocal opening. To see the vocal ligament, we'll look at a specimen in which the lamina of the thyroid cartilage has been removed on the right side. Here are the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilages. We'll add the vocal ligaments to the picture. Here they are. The vocal ligaments run from the thyroid cartilage in the midline to the tips of the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilages. They're fixed in front and highly mobile behind. Their tension is affected by the tilt of the cricoid cartilage. The gap between the vocal ligaments is affected by a rotation of the arytenoid cartilage. The vocal ligament isn't an isolated structure. It's the free upper border of this cone-shaped sheet of membrane the conus elasticus. The conus elasticus is attached below all the way along the upper border of the cricoid cartilage. Its upper border, which is free from here to here, forming the vocal ligament, is attached further back to the arytenoid cartilage. The anterior part of the conus elasticus is firmly attached to the thyroid cartilage, forming the cricothyroid ligament, which we saw earlier. Here's the right half of the larynx, with the mucous membrane intact. The conus elasticus is just beneath the mucous membrane, here. The mucous membrane is closely attached to the vocal ligament and also to the inner aspect of the arytenoid cartilage. At the level of the vocal folds, there's a narrowing between the walls of the larynx. Its anatomic name is the rima glottidis, but in this tape, we'll refer to it as the vocal opening. Its shape is extremely variable, depending on the movements of the arytenoid cartilages. Here's the vocal opening in a living person, seen from above. In quiet breathing, the opening is diamond-shaped. When we breathe deeply, it widens to a triangle. When we speak or sing, it narrows to a slit. When we hold our breath, 
it closes completely. Now we'll look at the muscles that produce movement between the cartilages of the larynx. First we'll see the cricothyroid muscle, then the two cricoarytenoid muscles, then the thyroarytenoid, transverse arytenoid, and aryepiglottic muscles. Here are the thyroid and cricoid cartilages with all the muscles removed. We'll add the cricothyroid muscle to the picture. Here it is. The cricothyroid muscle arises from here on the cricoid cartilage. It inserts on the thyroid cartilage, partly here on the lower border, and partly here on the inner aspect of the lamina. The cricothyroid muscle pulls the arch of the cricoid cartilage upwards. In doing so, it pulls the arytenoid cartilages backwards, making the vocal folds longer and tighter. To see the remaining muscles, we'll remove this half of the thyroid cartilage together with the cricothyroid muscle. Here are the internal laryngeal muscles. To begin understanding them, we'll take them all out of the picture for a moment. Here's the cricoid cartilage. Here's the arytenoid cartilage. Here's the conus elasticus. The vocal ligament is up here. This is the mucosa of the vestibule. The first muscles to add are the two cricoarytenoid muscles. Here's the posterior one. Here's the lateral one. They both converge on the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. The posterior cricoarytenoid muscle arises from here on the back of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscle arises from the upper border of the cricoid cartilage. The posterior cricoarytenoid pulls the muscular process backwards. This rotates the arytenoid cartilage, thus widening the focal opening. The lateral cricoarytenoid pulls the arytenoid cartilage forwards and laterally, drawing the vocal ligament towards the midline. The next two muscles that we'll see, the thyroarytenoid and transverse arytenoid muscles, act to shorten and narrow the vocal opening. We'll add the thyroarytenoid muscle to the picture first. Here it is. The thyroarytenoid muscle arises from here on the inner aspect of the thyroid cartilage. It inserts here in front of the lateral border of the arytenoid cartilage. Next, we'll add the transverse arytenoid muscle. Here it is. The transverse arytenoid muscle, also called the arytenoideus, is a sheet of muscle that bridges the gap between the posterior surfaces of the two arytenoid cartilages. Let's see how these two muscles work. Contraction of the thyroarytenoid muscle rotates the arytenoid cartilage inward and pulls it forward, along with the cricoid cartilage. This action slackens the vocal ligaments and shortens the vocal opening from front to back. Contraction of the transverse arytenoid muscle brings the two arytenoid cartilages closer together, thus closing the posterior part of the vocal opening. The sphincter action of the last two muscles is augmented by a pair of slender muscles that pass upwards toward the epiglottis, the aryepiglottic muscles. These begin behind the transverse arytenoid muscle, cross the midline, and extend upward and forward a little below the aryepiglottic fold. Acting together, the thyroarytenoid, transverse arytenoid, and aryepiglottic muscles act as a sphincter that can completely close the larynx. We close our larynx every time we swallow, cough, and hold our breath. The most medial part of the thyroarytenoid muscle, which is attached to the vocal ligament, has a special function. It's known as the vocalis muscle. It makes fine adjustments to the tension of the vocal ligament. We'll end this section on the larynx by looking at the structures that are close to it in front and below, the infrahyoid muscles and the thyroid gland. 
In addition, we'll see the parathyroid glands. Here again are the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the trachea. These are the rings of cartilage which reinforce the wall of the trachea. We'll add the carotid sheaths to the picture. Here, just on each side of the trachea, are two of the four parathyroid glands. They're recognizable by their brownish color. The other two parathyroid glands are further down. Next, we'll add the thyroid gland to the picture. Here it is. This is the left lobe of the thyroid gland. This is the right lobe. The two lobes are connected across the midline by the isthmus. The top of each lobe of the thyroid gland is level with the lower border of the thyroid cartilage. The top of the isthmus is about level with the third ring of the trachea. Now we'll add the four infrahyoid muscles to the picture. Starting with the two deepest ones, the thyrohyoid and the sternothyroid muscles. In effect, they're one continuous muscle. The thyrohyoid arises from the back of the body of the hyoid bone and inserts on the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. The sternothyroid arises from the same oblique line and passes down behind the upper end of the sternum. It inserts on the back of the sternum down here. Now we'll add the other two infrahyoid muscles to the picture, the omohyoid and the sternohyoid. The omohyoid muscle arises here, the sternohyoid here on the body of the hyoid bone. The sternohyoid runs straight downwards close to the midline and inserts on the back of the sternum here. The omohyoid muscle runs downwards laterally and backwards. It lies in front of the carotid sheath and the brachial plexus, which is under here. The omohyoid muscle passes beneath the trapezius muscle to insert on the upper border of the scapula. Finally, we'll return the clavicles and the sternocleidomastoid muscles to the picture. In looking at the intact neck, it's useful to remember that when the neck isn't extended, the bottom of the cricoid cartilage may be no higher than the top of the clavicle. Now, let's review what we've seen of the larynx and its surroundings. Here's the thyroid cartilage. Here's the cricoid cartilage. Here's the arytenoid cartilage with its colliculus, vocal process, and muscular process. Here's the trachea. Here's the cricothyroid ligament. Here's the conus elasticus. Here are the vocal ligaments. Here's the epiglottis, the ariepiglottic fold, the vallecula, and the piriform recess. Here's the vestibule, the vestibular fold, and the vocal fold. Here's the cricothyroid muscle, the cricoarytenoids, posterior and lateral, the thyroarytenoid muscle, and the transverse arytenoid muscle. Here are the parathyroid glands and the thyroid gland. Here are the thyrohyoid, sternothyroid, omohyoid, and sternohyoid muscles.